Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we have a study session for Act 78. That's the Police and Fire Civil Service Commission. Um, who is our guest speaker on this? Can you please stand up, come up to the microphone? Sure. Thank you. So my name is uh, Crandall, Martin Crandall. I'm... Uh, Hello, Marty Crandall. Bob Constant. I, How are you? I think I knew your dad many, many years ago. Yes. <clears throat> He's a lawyer in town here and he... And me. Yeah. Um, so I am the Public Act 78 president. Uh, that just means that I've been around the block a longer time than the rest of them. I got Steve Lobkovich here with me, who is our secretary. And Steve, as you all know, is a retired uh, fireman. And he sits on the council because we're hiring PNF all the time. And we got Steve Pop here, retired Dearborn Heights police officer, who was also elected to the commission by us, chosen by us to work with us. And our agenda is, as you probably know from reading the, uh, the minutes provided by uh, Elizabeth, who is our HR director and sits with us at all of the meetings and kind of guides us through the process because of her myriad years of experience. So between uh, Elizabeth and myself and Steve Pop and Steve Lobkovich, we do the uh, hiring and examining and qualifying of our uh, new police and fire as they're needed in the city as Elizabeth advises us as she learns from the chief of the fire department and the chief of the police department and we work together as a team to get that done and we've been doing it at least on my part for about 10 years now and Steve Lobkovich has been with us for what four or five years now Steve? Uh, a little over three. A little over three and Steve Pop has been with us two. Uh, the job couldn't be done without them because Without them, we couldn't know some of the intricacies that are, are, are brought to our attention at the uh, uh, police and fire meetings. But example is not too many months ago, we had an examination for pump operators that was a, let's say not a good test. Uh, by the time Steve Lobkovich tore it apart, we knew it wasn't a good test because he knew all of the answers to the questions and taught them to Steve Pop and I so we could administer the next test with a little bit better acumen. And that worked out well. And over the course of the last year, statistically, we have hired uh, several new police officers as a result of our process. We've hired several new uh, firemen as a result of our process. And we've promoted another large contingent of both fire and police throughout the city. So we meet every Monday morning, or excuse me, the first Monday of every month. Uh, we have an agenda that uh, Elizabeth puts together for us with the assistance of the Chief of Police and the Chief of the Fire. So when the questions come up, hopefully we can resolve them uh, and keep the fire and police fully, I would say manned, but we gotta say manned and women uh, appropriately to keep our forces up to speed, up to notch and top notch. I think we have a tremendous police department. I think we have a tremendous fire department. It's none of my doing. It's the doing of Elizabeth and Steve and Steve and our chiefs and our captains and our lieutenants and working our way down. So everybody's in the process at one level or another. With that opening, do you have any questions? No. Council members, anybody have a question? Councilman Muscat? The process I understand, but how does the process work for the command officers? Is that the same thing, uh, like chiefs on down? Uh, do they, how are they chosen? Everybody goes through a similar process. There is testing at every level. Uh, the test is merit-based. It's very competitive. Whether you're applying to be the chief or a captain, or a lieutenant, or a sergeant, or a police officer, <clears throat> or a first line fireman working your way up the ladder. You go through the process, it's a little different as you, as you get to the higher levels. For example, when you want to uh, have the, the uh, oral board 
for a captain or a lieutenant or a deputy chief or the chief, uh, you go through a little bit different process because you don't want it internalized. You don't want us at Public Act 78 being the examiners. So Elizabeth, with all of her skills and talents and connections, will find upper level, upper echelon police and fire in southeastern Michigan or beyond and bring them to the meetings to qualify for, to do the oral boards for the higher up officers seeking those positions. So they're competitive, every, competitive at every level. Uh, the testing is, uh, is very detailed. I mean, we use examiners that write these tests that you know go through books that they advise the applicants for these positions, uh, which books to look in, but when you got three months worth of reading to do, uh, there's a lot there. And so it's a, it's a very uh, arduous process from beginning to end. Does so, that answer your question right? Well, it, 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 yes, yes and no. But so when, for instance, someone is gonna be a sergeant, wants to test for a sergeant or a lieutenant, once all the testing is done and they, you know, somebody finishes in the top five, who, you know, uh, uh, obviously the command officer or the uh, or the chief then decides who they're going to promote to that position. Correct? No. Actually, Public Act seventy eight dictates Madam. the rules. It's been around Wait. since nineteen thirty five. Gary. Or I was there. Gary raised his hand. So the Public Act gets into uh, precise. Precise standard operating procedures, if you will, as to how you uh, create the exam, how you give the exam, how you score the testing. In other words, let's say 20 people, let's say five people are applying to be a sergeant in the police department. They all take the exam. They all take it on the same day at the same time, monitored by our team. The scores are. are um, evaluated by Elizabeth and the examiner and then by us and so you got probably seven people looking at the score <clears throat> maybe, maybe more and then you find out everybody's score and of those five people you got to get about 70 percent to qualify for the oral and then you take the oral boards and at the sergeant level you're going to have outside <clears throat> brought in from Westland, Wayne, wherever, and they're going to do the oral boards, and they ask the questions. And they ask the same questions of each one. Of course, they're all separate in, in a room alone with the examinee, and I've sat through many of those in here in the intro. And the process weans out the bad answers or the, or the bad people. That's it qualified. Elevates, it elevates the cream to the top, if you will. And that's the person that gets the job. And sometimes they're tied. And then you've got to go to other dimensions. What are the years in service? What are their service points? So you, you get extra points for... So it's the top, top score in both the oral and the uh, written exam that gets the job. So how does that work then for the chief of police or chief of, of, of fire, the fire chief? Okay, at this time, our corporate council, Council Miyake, would like to say something. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Marty. I just want to, I think what uh, the councilman might be looking at is more along the lines of precisely what happens. With an entry-level exam or entry-level position, the, the appointing or uh, officer who in, is actually the mayor, uh, that's one thing that I noticed here. Sorry, Elizabeth. Sorry, um, Commission. The the mayor is actually the appointing authority or the appointing officer. And for the uh, entry level position, uh, he has to choose among the top five. For a promotional exam, including for a chief, there is no discretion. The highest composite score. Uh, average composite score is the person who gets selected. Gets certified and then the mayor has no discretion but to choose that particular individual. Is, is that kind of what you were looking at, uh, 
Councilman? Yes. I yeah. have a little okay. to add to okay. that, if you don't mind. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. So the commission is charged with establishing an eligibility list out of qualified uh, individuals, whether it's for new hire list. They, get, they start out at a, uh, a written test. They have to pass a physical agility test. They have to go through a psych evaluation and several other steps in order to be placed on a list in order of scores. So, you know, let's, let's say for instance, someone scores an 80, he's the top guy. He's number one on the list. Yes, for new hires, the chief can recommend to the mayor, and yes, you're right, the mayor is the ultimate appointing authority. He operates on the recommendations of who we have established in order. When it comes to promotional exams, an individual first has to meet whatever qualifications are in their contract and the qualifications of Act 78 to acquire the next level. So if you're testing, say, for a police lieutenant, there's certain uh, baseline that they have to qualify for before they can apply for the job. Then they're a uh, given a written exam, which the commission reviews the exam prior to it being given for accuracy and for uh, acclimatization. I'm going to stumble over the word I want to use, but it applies to that position. Okay, so it's something that we're not asking about how to pick up garbage. We're asking them how to be a police supervisor here. We establish that, we get a, uh, an accurate test, what we feel is an accurate test. It's administered, they have to pass by at least 70% in order to be in, invited to an oral board. Oral board consists of three individuals chosen by the, the commission as well as with Elizabeth. She does a lot of our work for us, I, just like she does a lot of your work for you. And uh, <coughs> in getting us individuals that are qualified to sit on an oral board. Every individual that's asking questions at an oral interview is at least one rank above the person who's trying to be promoted. They have to pass that with a 70%. Takes 50% of the written score. So if I have a, let's say I just barely passed with a 70%, I have a 35. And my oral board was 70%, I'm not very good. 35, add those two together, and then add in their seniority points. And after that, we've established now the order, the score order for every promotion that we administer. So in other words, Act 78 is a good protection between from Absolutely. nepotism and friendships and all of that. That Act kind of does away from that. It's the exact opposite of nepotism. It's the exact opposite of favoritism or Good buddyism, whatever you want to call yeah. it, it's the exact opposite. That's that this ensures is, this us. Is what, and, and this commission, by the way, has been accepted by all three unions that we serve as being the steps that they want in order to promote within their ranks. With, in order to promote within this department. Now, the only thing that would be a little bit different when you get to the chief's level. Instead of the three-man war award, they sit in an ass assessment center after they've taken their written exam. They go to an assessment center where they get grilled for probably four to eight hours. I, I, I've never sat in one, but I know it's lengthy and very intense. And then we, we establish an order by score. Add in seniority <coughs> points, and you get the top dog. And yes, then the mayor gets the esteemed privilege to promote that individual. Sorry for his luck. <laughs> I'm uh, not. No, I'm just saying it, it, it's, it's tough. Day. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough decision. Okay, next we have Councilman Abdullah. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Stay right here, Steve. <laughs> hey, thank you. Good. Well, you want to ask me something? Good. Yeah. So, so I, had, I had a couple different questions. Um, one of the Critic and, and I think overall, I think it's a, it's a very good program for our city to have. But one of the criticisms of this particular act has been that you cannot hire from the outside, specifically at the top level. So, in other words, obviously we're blessed to have two great chiefs, but let's just say somebody out there uh, 20 years from now, so we're not going to say for you guys, 20 years from now, want to hire somebody from out there that's really, really good at what they do. Based on this particular act, you cannot hire them as a city. Is that correct? 
I believe that's correct. For the chief's position. Corporate counsel will probably answer that more legally than I can, but. Corporate, you have, you corporate have, counsel Miyaki, go ahead, thank please. Thank you, you have two reasons why you would not be able to do so. First of all, it's not just under Act 78. You have to remember, and I think I discussed this before when we were talking about the charter, PARA prevails. So the collective bargaining agreement, regardless of what Act 78 says, the collective bargaining ag agreement would basically say what would end up happening in general in terms of your ability to go outside. If there was a collective bargaining agreement change, you could potentially go outside whether or not Act 78 provides for it. And if Act 78 wasn't around, you still would end up having to have the unions agree to it in the collective bargaining agreement uh, because essentially PARA prevails, you have to go with the collective bargaining agreement. So you have two different issues and still PARA is the, pre, you know, the premier act, the primary act that dictates uh, how we handle labor relations in the state of Michigan. So even if you say, geez, we don't like Act 78, if you were going to change that, you would have to change the collective bargaining agreement however you go about trying to do it. For example, um, under Act 78, you have a process having to do with disciplinary procedures. The unions and the collective bargaining agreements, and this is typical throughout Southeast Michigan where there is Act 78, instead usually rely on grievance arbitration to deal with all disciplinary matters except very rarely have I ever gotten pulled in before Act 78 about anything disciplinary. That's because PARA prevails, the collective bargaining agreement provides for that procedure, and even though it departs from Act 78, it is the way it must be done because of the collective bargaining agreement. Okay. Does that help? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So this is not meant to grill you guys. This is just to get a better understanding of this. Fire so, away. Yeah. So not all cities have Act 78, okay? Um, I mean, a lot of them don't, obviously. And there's, there's, of course, some that do. And I see definitely the advantages of taking somebody from within. So I see, like, for example, in my business, I would want somebody that's going to be our leader that maybe started at the bottom in my business and they worked their way up and they're very familiar with the A to Z of the mm -hmm. particular company. Same thing here, obviously, in the fire and the police department. But what reasons do a lot of cities have for not using Act 78? Like, what is the plus other than just obviously being able to hire from outside? Obviously, that's, uh, when I say an advantage, it's not necessarily always an advantage, but you have more choices, at least. Councilman, it's my understanding that the state mandates that any municipality that has paid police and paid fire must have a civil service uh, process set up, a civil service system set up. Do you have to adopt Act 78? Maybe not. I, other uh, other municipalities don't have it. Mm -hmm. This is what, back when our city was formed, our forefathers chose. This is the way we want to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's worked. I, I don't know of any policeman or fireman, I was here 28 years working and still continuing with this, that had a problem with the way that the Civil Service Commission handled their employment. I would have to agree that overall it has worked because obviously as far as fire is concerned, we have no major problems, we're blessed. And as far as police is concerned, uh, I can tell you consistently, obviously we're ranked, uh, as a matter of fact, we're top 10 as far as uh, the least amount of crime is concerned. So well, here, here, obviously something's working. I, I think here's the thing about this is, do other cities get to choose who their next top dog is. Uh, I mean, example, Detroit. So. Detroit obviously doesn't but, have it. But when you look at the way Dearborn Heights operates within the police and fire and within this commission, we almost guarantee you the best candidate you can have who has came through your whole system from bottom to top. They've come along, they've gone to schools, they've been trained, they know the city, and to go somewhere else just to have someone who I didn't even know why you would would want to do that. You got you have the opportunity to always put someone who came through your whole system at the top of your department. Sure. Doesn't make much sense to me. I'm having a hard time understanding. I mean, I get you know have a study session and learning about how the commission operates, all that stuff. I think that's fantastic. I. I have a little trouble with the mo uh, motivation of why we're looking into one of the uh, divisions within the city that actually functions very well. 
and has for many, for a long time. Council Chair. Council, I'm sorry, Corporate Council Miyake? Uh, yeah, just, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve. Just one correction. You don't have to have the civil service. Actually, if, uh, if and the city has Act 78 by virtue of a referendum that ended up being adopted many years ago. But if the city did not have Act 78, per the city charter, there would be another form of civil service, the general government civil service, would still apply to all employees. So civil service is particularly prominent because in the 1930s, there was horrible turnover in state government. It was it, it, because of how bad things were, like 300% turnover. And so one of the ideas of having civil service is to have stability and have people not being selected based on something other than their merit. So that's why it's been adopted in so many communities. And some of the communities that have gotten rid of it, for example, Highland Park got rid of Act 78 a number of years ago, even though it was one of the first communities that had Act 78. I don't necessarily know that you would want our labor and employment matters handled in the same way, um, you know, where there's a potential for decisions being made based on, you know, political factors and favoritism and other such things other than merit. Are, are they not tested? If, so if a city does not have Act uh, 78, are they not tested? I, mean, I presume they would they, still be they tested. They would have to be MCOL certified in order to be police officers, but they would not necessarily have to go through any sort of merit-based system to end up being hired. And then that makes it a potential decision of whoever happens to be in power at that time. I've seen situations where, you know, in my private practice, I'm not speaking here, where you see people who've been very active in campaigns who get elevated to very high positions and then after that particular official is no longer in a high position with city government, now everyone's trying to figure out a way to get rid of him or her. So that's a cautionary tale. No, just to clarify, without Act 78, presuming the city did not have it, let's use that presumption, the mayor has a right to hire anybody, that, let's, let's use police for example, anybody that's a police officer without testing and make them chief, no. Without Act 78, you would still have to, first of all, go to whatever the collective bargaining agreement would be. That process would end up being in place regardless of whether or not anyone got rid of Act 78, okay? Assuming you got rid of Act 78 and the collective bargaining agreement said, we'll do whatever you want, then you would end up having to go through general government civil service per the city charter. Assuming you got rid of that, then you would potentially have whatever process came, you know, you have for in terms of hiring. Of course, that's hard to think about in terms of hypothetically, because we've had general government civil service in Act 78 since, as far as I can tell, the 1960s. So. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. Councilman Constant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so is it safe to say, Officer Lopkovich and uh, Martin Crandall, it's uh, a due process system, and it, while it's not perfect, it uh, prevents nepotism, favoritism. Um, you know, I, I can remember when I was state representative, um, the city of Inkster hired uh, Hilton Napoleon, who was Benny Napoleon's brother, and then the caretaker mayor, it, they had a city manager, was elevated to some position, and there was a lot of stuff in the news, and, and, and then after that mayor was gone, they had a new uh, chief. So, so, like I say, it's, it's, it's not a perfect system, but... Um, I'd like to ask, what's not perfect about it so far? So it's, we can work it, on it. I, I say I it's mean, a perfect, perfect system. Like. You know, it's funny, my <laughs> father, who's 95, who was on the Charter Commission, says that John Canfield, who was then the supervisor, wanted to be able to pick the chief and pick his friends, and they had a presentation about Act 78, and they instituted Act 78, and the supervisor who became mayor wasn't particularly for it. 
I can tell you in the 10 years that I've been here, it's perfectly apolitical. There is no political influence on us Madam Chair. what we do. Councilman Bidu. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I just got a couple of questions. My first question is, can, do we know how many other cities have adopted Public Act 78? We, we don't know that? I don't know that. I, I work here. I worked here a career, <coughs> and I'm continuing my service now. I don't know what every other city has, no. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all. Thank you. Madam Chair. Did you want Councilman Abdelhaq? Yeah, you leave the best for the I sure last. did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, first, why do you think we called you here to ask you questions? Because you made, I can made the comment. A lot of things. I don't want you to made do the that. comment that there is a motive. What do you think the motive for city council who approve I, I, who approve your uh, money for your commission asking a question about what you do in the city? Well, I, I think it's it's very fair that you ask questions about what we do That's because exactly. you are spending money there. Uh, but I don't know what your driving factor is other than that. If, if there's something else, I'd sure like to know. We really like to learn about every division, everything happening in our city, because I believe personally, watching the city council for 17 years, mm -hmm. that the previous administration, and sorry to bring it back, never paid attention to what's going on in the police department or the fire department, especially that the new hires, they deserve a lot better than what they get in, and they deserve better benefit than what they done. Madam Chair, this is a matter of opinion. This is nothing factual that this man is, is speaking okay. at this moment. Can you tell, I'm going back to facts, how many black officers we have in the fire department, in the police department. How many I, times I think, you tried? I think before you get to that point, yes. you would have to ask how many black applicants have we had in the police and the fire department. We don't vet against any race, religion. Okay. It's illegal for us to do it. We don't want to do it. And we don't do it. Do you have? If, if we don't have applicants that come through the door that are minorities or anybody, women that want these jobs, we can't create them. There's only one creator. Do we have list for the last five years how many applicants applied for police and fire? Sure. Probably. Okay. You have it. I would like a copy of it, please, and I would like to see if they took test what their scores were on the oral and on the written, if that possible. Uh, why do you think Act 78 is better than civil service test, like we have a civil service for other, you know, government jobs. Why don't we have only one? Why do we have to have two? I, to me, it seems like the function is the same. What is the difference between the two? Well, I'm not that familiar with the general government civil service and their, their dealings or, or procedures. Uh, Again, I, I would refer back to in the 60s when the city who the managers that were here at the time chose Act 35 as the method that they wanted to run their police, their professional police and professional firefighters. And we've been here ever since doing exactly that. That's no problem that the people vote for it. In Act 78, people vote for it. Like they vote for it, they can vote to rescind it too. I sure. believe. Sure, if you had it on an election day, uh, would have the opportunity to say what they want. Now, we have settled so many lawsuits involving police officers. And, I can't speak to that. But. And uh, always the city paid thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, as a matter of fact, sometimes. And we never seen any disciplinary action against any officer. Isn't that strange that the city pays that amount of money and no disciplinary action? I, we have Council, nothing to do with Council it. Chair, humble man. Well, it has nothing to do. Nothing. You do the, uh, the suspension, the promotions. When you look, 
when you look and at chair. their file. Okay, uh, corporate counsel, go ahead, please. Um, I would note, uh, if I may, uh, Councilman Abdul Haq, they would not necessarily be privy to all of the disciplinary action that would end up being imposed, that much of this would end up being uh, done administratively, and that just because we settle lawsuits for certain amounts, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's always merit to that lawsuit. Sometimes we do it because of risk that's involved, and we want to make sure that we don't have a greater risk of something being problematic. For example, if, if evidence is not found or there's some problem with a camera or something along those lines, and an inference could end up being drawn in a negative way, that's something that we need to end up avoiding. So while I respect your point, obviously, I, I think it's a little, uh, uh, a little too aggressive to perhaps take from the settlements that we have that that means that there is a problem with the way the system has failed to function. Moreover, Act 78, as I stated before, the collective bargaining agreement generally, the collective bargaining agreements generally uh, handles anything having to do with discipline. So whether or not you have Act 78, isn't going to end up making a difference with that because essentially the grievance arbitration procedure in the collective bargaining agreements takes priority to what is in Act 78. And like I've said, I think I may have attended two, probably in 1990, I ended up attending something having to do with a disciplinary action. Other than that, every time it's usually done through grievance arbitration procedure. So. Um, I'm sorry to go on, but Mr. I hope that Mayatke, I, I know the union and the agreement is there, and I understand probably uh, it supersede Act 78. Yes. But I want personally, since we have strong mayor in the city, our system, that's how it goes. I would like to see that the mayor, whoever it is, has the power to bring the best of the best to our city to be the chief. I would like to have that power at the hand of the next mayor. That's why I brought this in front sure. of the city and council. Councilman, can I ask you one question? Yes, sir. How is it you would go about finding the best of the best when we go through the process to give you the best of our best? We always have terrific people outside of the city. We don't have to go to a small pool which is in the city. Nothing and against who would anybody. who the best of the best is? There should be some exam through civil service or whatever uh, system Maybe. is. Uh, okay. Bring it right back to us. Yeah. No, n not necessarily to you. Uh, what I'm saying, I don't need double uh, commissions. I need one commission. One civil service commission. I don't see any need for Act 78. That's my opinion. And that's why I want to raise it in front of you that Act 78 shouldn't exist in the city. And there should. Okay, corporate council. Really, I don't know you guys. I don't know any one of you, and nothing against any one of you. That's a okay. Corporate Council Miyaki would like to speak. There is election. You can come out and vote as you like. No, no. Corporate Council Miyaki would like to speak at this time. No, Go ahead, Council please. Chair, thank you. If the issue is purely about the promotional path for chief, then that issue would have to end up because it has to do with the promotional opportunities of those that, who are in a lower rank than chief then that issue would have to be negotiated with the unions to end up reaching that. So if your issue is with regard to that issue, namely how the promotion is done, then the most direct way to deal with that is through the collective bargaining uh, process and negotiations as opposed to anything having to do with Act 78. The, I agree with you, Gary, and that's the next thing we want to do is basically to make sure that the contract negotiated will do the right things for the right people who are working in the city. Okay. I, okay. Next, we have Councilman Muscat. Yeah, I, I mean, I came here to kind of learn the processes because I really didn't know the complete process. Other than I know it, it's a, I've heard of the civil service and 
you went in front of boards and you took a test. So you guys enlightened me quite a bit. And it sure seems a lot better than what it sounded before I came in here. Okay, so um, I think it's a good way to, to uh, protect all of us and uh, choose the right person. I think you got, you know, it really makes sense to me now of why it really happens. So uh, kudos to you guys. Thank you, sir. You know, I also have to say the same thing. Before I came here today, I really wasn't sure what Act 78 was about, and I do agree with what you're saying. You're having somebody go up the ranks. Um, you know, when I started working as, at a young age for a company, I went up the ranks the same way. It's, it's part of learning the whole company and everything about it. And to just start at the top doesn't necessarily mean they're the best, because they may not understand what has evolved in the city over the years to make it what it is today. You know, and, and, that's, and that's the way it worked with us when, when in our jobs we had leaders and we have what they called super leaders. And, and it got to the point where bosses were making their friends the leaders and super leaders, and it, and it was tough, okay? And, and it just, and, and being in a union, it wasn't very smart to have something like that. So an oversight committee, which is what I'm going to call you guys, an oversight committee, make sure that that, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay, where my buddy's going to get the job before the guy with the high score gets it. Your okay. ability and to move up. Yeah, your I ability also counts. Continue to work at that department. Right. right. Your ability yeah. counts more than everything, yeah. Right, because like I said, when I was with AT&T, in order to transfer to a different department, you had to take a test. If you flunked the test, you didn't get it. So there was no favoritism. So I understand exactly what this is about. Um, Councilman Abdullah? So just a couple of notes on here. Um, I mean, I can see the advantages, of course, of sometimes of going out. But honestly, I see a lot more advantages to Act 78 because you're getting somebody that's experienced in the city, okay, that's been here 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever it happens to be, which I think is a huge plus, knowing the city, whether it's a fireman or a police officer. And, and, and I do see where the counts, where Councilman Zohar is, is is coming from as far as like other options available. I do see that. But at the same time, more important than that is I think local experience. I think it is extremely important. So if we got somebody as a fire chief or a police chief and they're from you know DC or Los Angeles or what have you they may be great at what they do but I think they're gonna be clueless in, in, in Dearborn Heights to be able to do it well mm -hmm. I'm also seeing it from thinking about it from a, a police officers or a fireman's perspective if I'm a fireman and I'm gonna give this city 20 30 or 40 years I'd like to be one of the main people that's considered for that, you know, uh, promotion. So if I did not think that would be one of the people that would be considered, when I say I, I'm talking about people in general, would probably think, well, I have no opportunity at a chief here or deputy chief, then I'm out of here. Therefore, in that particular case, we're going to lose potentially well-experienced, well-dedicated, and uh, potentially great people to other cities. So I can see both arguments, but in my view, I think there's more pluses to it than than, uh, than negatives. And I definitely see, honestly, I never thought about it until you guys brought it up right now, you know, the, the, the issue with nepotism. I mean, I, I, I could definitely see that potentially happening if I'm in charge of whatever particular city and, and I got my buddy and it's kind of scary that just has just police officer uh, credentials, which is great, of course. But a, a brand new officer or officer in a year or two, I would not put him as a chief. So that's one of the positive attributes of this. And that's it, thank you. Okay, next I have Steve Pomp wants to speak. Well, let me just add one thing there, Councilman, to the nepotism thing. And this is just an example of how this commission operates. Recently, my son tested for lieutenant. I had to recuse myself from the testing to eliminate the possibility of nepotism. That's how we work. But that's normal, you have to recuse yourself. Say that? That's normal, you have to recuse yourself. Okay, so it's normal, but yeah. that's what we do. And We're normal, chair. we operate normally. Thank we you. We operate. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair. Chair. Uh, we're going to go on. We'll let them present and then we'll ask questions because we're not even halfway through this. I just wanted to add uh, something. The uh, Act 78 Commission 
We do more than just uh, do the promotion lists, uh, make sure or, or get the chief, all that other stuff. We do more than promotions. We also protect the employees, um, you know, on the promotions to make sure that the promotions are done right. When somebody's up for promotion and they go through that process, that you don't have an administrator or somebody up there, and it gets regards to the nepotism that says, no, I don't want this guy in there, even because maybe he don't like him through the past or whatever, and brings him back, and then somebody mo jumps ahead of him. And we, we are there to protect that, and that is part of Act 78. So we're not just here to, you know, to make sure all the promotions and the hirings go. There's more to that, that, you know, we do more in Act 78 than just that. We make sure the process is fair. Madam, That's what we do. Madam Chair. And I agree with Marty Crandall and Steve Lopkovich. We, I have never, I've been here for two years. I've been on the police department for 30 years. I've never once been influenced by anybody to make any decision on hiring. Uh, you know, asking about how many blacks that have been hired through the Act 78, I kind of take a little issue with that. Uh, respectfully, Mr. Abelhock, I don't think that was necessary here. No. Unless, unless Wait. you have some reason to think that we might have done it, but you no, don't have no, no, any no. evidence I, or anything at all to bring that up here, like Act 78 has something to do with that. Uh, i sorry, I had to speak to you. You misunderstand what no, I, I said. No, I understood right, exactly right, what right. you said. Point of order. Madam Chair. Okay, at this I, time. I just want to ask a question. Okay, can we let them finish this whole presentation? No, I just have a question about the uh, selection of, let's say you have the three, three candidates and they tested for a specific position. And my understanding you take the top three or you take the top person and he is automatically promoted. Number one is number one. Okay. He's offered the job by the mayor. So the mayor has the final say. He's a boss, yes. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair. Can we finish this presentation, please? Are you done with your part of presenting, or is, can we go to questions? I, I think we're done. Okay, yeah, then Madam we'll Chair. go to questions. If you have questions, that's fine. I think oh. we're done. Tell us what they do. Yeah. I believe uh, I've been done with the speaker with Phil earlier today. He said he had some things that he wanted to present. So before we start that over. He asked for recognition. What's that? Are you asking for recognition? I raised my hand. Like yeah, my that's yeah you, have, you have to say council chair. That's a procedure. So go ahead. Co council chair. chair. I I'm sorry. I don't know and who was I speaking. Recognize. So I, I, are you speaking with the mayor or are you speaking with the mayor? I'm sorry. I didn't know. I think the mayor wants to talk. Okay, go ahead. But you want to talk, right? Well, go yes, ahead. I raised my hand. You were looking right at me, Council Chair. But anyway, I, uh, I, I, I mean, most of you already know. I, I, I did, sub, I did send everybody a, uh, a, actually an email regarding this. So we could have pro probably prevented most of the questions here from the email I sent about Act 78. But pretty much what I wanted to say is what Mr. Miyake already mentioned in part of the bargaining agreement, you know, that we're reviewing. It does have stuff about, you know, the promotion, you know, and the, the way it's done. And it is pretty reasonable. So, I mean, I've, I've been looking at it for the last month and a half. Madam Chair. Councilman they do. Thank you so much. I just want to recognize Phil Holes in the room with us. He did want to present. He had some information. Can we give him some time on the floor? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, Council Members, Mayor Bozzi and residents. My name is Phil Hall. I'm the president of the Dearborn Heights Professional Firefighters Union. I'm also a battalion chief uh, on the road in suppression for the Dearborn Heights Fire Department. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to express to this body the adamant opposition that the Dearborn Heights Firefighters Union, and I believe my brothers from the police unions, have for any changes to the Act 78 civil service system. The Act 78 civil service system has been in place for the hirings and promotions of firefighters and police officers in this city for many years, especially now where the state of Michigan as a whole is facing a hiring crisis of first responders. What system will replace the fair and equitable process that was confirmed by a majority of the voters of this city? The Act 78 civil service system ensures an equal opportunity hiring and promotional process for all police, police officers and firefighters in the city of Dearborn Heights. Act 78 as an entity, and thank you very much, 
directly enforces the city charter language that Mr. Miyake can show you all, preventing nepotism in the hiring and promotional processes. The prevention, as many of you stated, of nepotism and favoritism is the heart and the mission of Act 78. Why then would anyone want to remove this system that provides an equal and unbiased process for the hiring and the promotion of police officers and firefighters in the city of Dearborn Heights? The Act 78 civil service system is a permissible subject of bargaining, as you said, Mr. Miyake. And the language for this process is contained in the collective bargaining agreements for all three first responder unions. Any changes or deviation from this system that do not occur at the bargaining table are unilateral changes of working conditions and will trigger an unfair labor practice and trigger the grievance process. I strongly encourage General Counsel Miyake to apprise this honorable body of the legal impact to the city that could arise. The Act 78 system also provides our veterans with preference points for their service during the hiring process. Any changes to the Act 78 process will negatively affect the hiring of veterans to the police and fire departments. Can any of you say that you would want to negatively impact the hiring of veterans into the first responder positions in the city of Dearborn Heights? Over the past several months, there have been multiple meetings directly related to subjects contained in the collective bargaining agreements for the three first responder unions. This is creating a feeling of unrest and insecurity in the respective departments. I implore you to consider the consequences for these actions. We have excellent first responders in this city that literally put themselves in harm's way every single day for the residents, and yet there have been ongoing conversations to erode items that were negotiated in good faith through the collective bargaining process. I simply want to know why. I want to know why. What is the end goal to be achieved? Why are we here meeting on this instead of having a meeting on appropriations for funding for negative, that was for residents in our community that were negatively impacted during the floods last week? Thank you for your time and consideration. I yield the rest of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilman Constant? Yeah, and just a comment. I mean, this council debated and uh, voted that our dispatch, we're going to have our people here. We want our dispatch here. People have campaigned. I kept the, the, our uh, dispatch here in Dearborn Heights. It's, you know, the, the due process, the civil service provisions in, in Act 78, it's the same thing. Thank you. Any further comments from the council table? Madam Chair, I got one last question. Councilman Bay, don't go like ahead, please. The, what's that? Said, Councilman Bay, don't go ahead, please. Thank you so much. I'd also like to hear from the mayor, just to kind of see if his input and what he thinks of this. I know okay. he spoke a little bit about it, researching it, but I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, w I would like to hear from the mayor. That's okay. No, I mean, I, I, for the, since, since I was appointed, I worked very closely with both the fire department and police department, and uh, it, it is disheartening to see, you know, a, a lot of discussion. And I know we've sent a lot of, there was a lot of email traffic, you know, uh, that w was sent, you know, the previous topics that we dis discussed about the pension. But it, it is disheartening when you, uh, when it keeps being brought up. I mean, this is their livelihood, and we already discussed it several months ago about you know the pension about the pay you know these guys you know they take pretty much pay cuts to come here because of the benefits of city of Dearborn Heights and you know most of you have been at the last since I've been on council three years and now being mayor I hear nothing but compliments about both the fire and police department you know and and it, it's really scary you know for me you know as, as a mayor right now you know, when they come up to me and they tell me, hey, you know what, I mean, are we going to lose our pension? Are we going to, you know, this and that? I really don't want this conversation to keep going because, you know, I don't want to lose great police officers and great firefighters. You know, it's, uh, like I said, it is, uh, it is disturbing when they come up to my office. I, like I mentioned before, I have an open door policy and a lot of them come and talk to me and I don't want to lose any of them. And, uh, with this here, you know, like, like we said before with Mr. Miyake, with uh, the bargaining agreement, you know, we've been going through it, you know, line by line with uh, our HR director. And I mean, the, the promotion process is very reasonable. And uh, again, you know, these guys are amazing. I've seen nothing but the, great, the greatest things. I'm really proud of them. I've seen a lot of fire departments, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, police departments, but these guys really go way and above. And Dearborn Heights has suffered a lot, you know, with the pandemic, you know, with COVID. You know, these guys, 
I've been walking a lot, you know, I walked a lot. I've seen, you know, some of the stuff, you know, when they pulled somebody over for somebody doing something stupid, you know, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, they're like face to face with somebody that might have COVID. Our first responders, you know, they're putting somebody in an amb ambulance with, uh, that has COVID. And you know what, they never complain. And you know, they are, uh, they do have anxiety and really, really got to put this stuff past us. We got to move forward. And I said before, we got to propel our city forward. We got to get rid of all this negative stuff about, you know, and these guys have done nothing but amazing work for the city of Dearborn Heights. I'm really proud of them. Then my, my last question is, I, so I was never in the Marines and thank you for your services to our mayor. Madam uh, Chair. And I, I'm sure the way that, you know, it's the same thing where, you know, the chief or your commander becomes girls from within. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it is it is very reasonable, you know, and we discussed it at some of the bargaining uh, uh, discussion, you know, with the mil the way the military promotes, well, especially the Marines, you know, and it is pretty similar to what they do. You know, you do have a committee like, you know, the Act 78 committee and the Marines actually has something similar. And you have people that have no idea who the police officer, who the firefighter is, you know, when they promote. And they give them points. It's the same system. And all the service, all the services actually complement the way the Marines promote. It's because they don't know who the person is. They just go by, by the interview and by the, the point system. So, I mean, it, it is, I, I don't, I, yeah. And again, uh, and thank you for your support. And, uh, and I thank them for all their support. Okay, Councilman Abdul Haq. Okay. Uh, Mayor, yeah. you can, I believe there is the OPB, OPEB right there behind you, Gary. Can you read that number, how much liability we have for the gentleman here? I don't know. 168,693,439. I fought for you to have the fund 115. He's fine. Mm -hmm. voted yes on everything for the police and fire and I will continue to vote for everything which make you do your job in the best way possible and your safety is a priority for me and the safety of the people too but the reason I'm doing this I want to explore everything to make sure everybody getting fair shot in the city and getting the fair benefit which they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further comment? Corporate counsel at the mayor. Oh, you know what? I can't. I apologize. I can't see behind these guys. Yeah, there. I, I, so just I, ask for recognition, so I know you need it, because okay, that way I'll, I'll say something. You guys okay. are in the back. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to uh, point out two things. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about. We've talked a little bit about liability, and one of the things about a system like Act 78, it cuts down on the exposure of the city by having this type of procedure that's merit-based. So you have less of an opportunity to end up having people bringing a claim for failing to hire, failing to promote. Discrimination, as Councilman Muscat just said. So that's one of the other benefits. Um, and um, Phil? <laughs> I didn't know what to call you, BC, you know. Uh, okay, so Phil, <laughs> so Phil ended up pointing out something. There was a communication that was received, and I wanted to clarify something. There's no unfair labor practice from this body discussing things having to do with, with uh, this type of topic. Uh, I think someone intimated that there would be. There is not. Uh, any more than if they had a change in a position and wanted to discuss it among themselves as unions. Um, however, if things are not negotiated, if there is any unilateral change, that would draw an unfair labor practice. So uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Any other co you. comments from the council table? Okay, at this time we can open it up to public comment, which is a two minute limit because this is a study session. Come up to the podium, state your name. <coughs> this time, seeing none. I guess that concludes our study. So, oh, do you want, okay, go ahead, sir. Hi, my name is Walter J. Solovey. I've been a resident of this city for probably close to 67 years. I've seen a lot of changes in this town that I kind of shake my head about. I remember in 63 when the city incorporated, 
when you came into the city it said welcome to Dearborn Heights city with a future some of the future I'm seeing is kind of bleak in my opinion I've watched changes in neighborhoods I've watched people's homes get run down to the ground I've seen backyards turn into jungles I have seen properties that were diamonds turn into dumps now I'm walk I've been living off of Warren I've been looking at an eyesore on the corner of my street that I can't understand why it's not had the city just come down on it they just built a wall to separate residency from commercial I'm not a mortar guy I'm not a bricklayer but usually you put mortar between the vertical seams as well as the horizontal seams there ain't no mortar between those vertical seams is that city code is that where our standards have lowered themselves to this is my question to you guys is this going to be allowed okay you look at the wall it looks like this oh, okay sir you 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 ask the question through the council chair and then tell me who to direct it to out here to answer it for well, you basically I'm presenting it to everyone if they had anyone has any opinions if anybody council knows chair. the rules uh, if anybody council knows chair. the ordinances that, that's something you get. should call the ordinance department on if, and have them come look at it okay uh, you know we're we're, we're, we're we're trying to deal with a certain act 78 here I got it and, and, and but all you need to do is either call the ordinance department which is that's the first step to do and if you don't get satisfaction then call one of us I'm sure one of us will be glad to take okay. up your let me let me just add one more final closing thought and I'll be done with my say why when there was a uh, boundary uh, a hedgerow that was there and was planted 25 years ago to provide that barrier between residential and commercial it was cut down without a permit a ticket was issued to the landlord of that property who also parks commercial vehicles out there all the time and from what I understand that ticket kind of went away and now they put up this half butt wall again that's that's going to be an ordinance issue and, and you know what I get from ordinance well, if you're you're not going to no get any results. satisfaction, and you get one of us, okay, we'll bring okay. it up, and then I guess uh, 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 the I mean, I'll, corporate I'll council here with can, can or the chair. Sir, minute. can That's you tell us the address of uh, where it's behind? It is maybe on we the uh, northwest corner of Highview and Warren Avenue. Okay, is it? There's businesses there, isn't there? Yes, there is, and it's a pigsty back there. It's a pigsty. Pallets, trash. Rats, all of the above. I can, I can almost guarantee the ordinance department is going to hear about it tomorrow morning. Well, you know what I've been told by ordinance, and I don't know who it was. Evidently, the guy that owns that has a multitude of properties in this city, and he's got multitudes of problems with it. And it's disgusting, because it seems like he just keeps getting a blind eye and a free pass on this stuff. Well, I can tell you that these guys here, they're, uh, you know, they, they don't like it either. Okay. Okay. police when litigation against you guys took place also. Too? federal lawsuits that were dismissed because they were just based on lies against you guys okay councilman abdel haq councilman abdel haq i would like to direct this to our mayor please if you can take care of it tomorrow please i got the address thank you okay. madam chair madam chair okay. i mean she, uh, you sorry. have to say madam chair because I, I can't i didn't say madam chair i got the address. no if you want to talk, whoever oh, okay. has, wants to talk, that's yeah. the rules. Because I can't see Councilman Constant is right here. Councilman Muscat blocks Mr. Miyaki sometimes. So, okay, sure. Councilman Abdella. If you don't mind, uh, our emergency manager, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but because of the timeliness, can you give the residents, if you don't mind, just a general update as far as the garbage, the hauling of the stuff from the streets? Um, just just generic update and then to make sure that they fill out those forms so we can turn in enough numbers to FEMA and get reimbursements hopefully for the residents so real sorry quick, for putting you on the spot but I know you know what you're it. talking real about quick, this morning we turned into um, Wayne County over 1150 flooded homes um, compared to Dearborn they had 11,000 so um, we asked our residents they have, if they have not yet filled out a survey form it is available when you come in the doors of City Hall or online. We're continuing to uh, put those in a database. 
Like I said, we submit everything to <coughs> Wayne County. They're moving it up the ladder to the state, and then it'll go to the um, federal um, side. FEMA is expected to be in town Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We don't know which day in our community yet. They'll have some teams. We'll go out with those teams to certain areas in the city, wherever they want to go. I have it uh, marked down what areas um, had more flooding than others. And, uh, what about garbage and, and extra pickup from, from the flooding? So with the garbage, GFL, as we all know, they have the contract with our city, Dearborn, and a few others. So um, the mayor has uh, been working with them. We've got them picking up the trash. They started Saturday, and they got a lot of Saturday. They did Monday's pickup. So what they're doing is they're getting um, pickup, like Monday's trash pickup. They got Tuesday's. They got Today they're working on Wednesdays. No, I'm talking flooding. about extra stuff from people's basements. That's what he's flooding stuff. About. That's what they're picking up. We still ask our residents to put everything at the curbside. GFL will get it. They're, we're not doing any compost pickup this week. So don't, uh, our residents, don't put out any um, grass, any leaves, anything like that. We're using nose trucks to pick up the flooding items at the curbside. And it doesn't have to be on your garbage day from what I understand, is no. that correct? No. no, they're coming by, you know, they're still doing the regular garbage day pickup. Plus, in addition to that, they have some trucks doing the flooding items at the curb. They expect to come in again Saturday and go through the whole city again and get any homes that they might have missed or people that brought out the debris at a later time. So we ask our residents to bear with us, put the trash at the curbside, GFL is making progress, and hopefully by Saturday, um, the mayor's talked to them, and hopefully by Saturday, we'll have it all picked up. Um, but they're making progress a little at a time. Good, thank you. Any questions from the council in regards uh, just, to- Just a quick comment, uh, 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 Go ahead, please. emergency manager uh, Gavin. Uh, I watched these guys working on Saturday. These guys are working hard, mm -hmm. picking up everything, and I've seen one guy even uh, pull out a rake off the truck and raked the guy's lawn because he had a bunch of drywall there and raked up the lawn and got it into the street and shoveled it up and did a great job. So they're, they're working hard and it's going to take a while. There's a lot of, a lot of debris out there. It may only be 1,000 homes or 1,100 homes, but the amount of debris that's out there is, my pile is stacked up, okay, so. Sometimes two or three homes fill up a whole, whole truck. Correct. So it's Correct. taking they gotta a while. they got to go dump it. Another question that I've been asked by residents, if they file with our city, can they still file for, I know, I know the answer, but if you could address that a little bit, can they still file for insurance or is it, so in other words, a lot of residents have asked, is it just one or the other or can they file for both at the same time? Nope, all we have, our form is just a survey form. No claim, no financial assistance, it's just a survey form, so we have it in our database. We ask them to contact their insurance company. A lot of people do not have the rider for water to come up through the sewers, sewer backup, sewer rider. <clears throat> so fill out our form. When FEMA gets here, that and, and it's declared a disaster area, that will between, be de, between each individual homeowner and FEMA. If it's approved, we'll set up a meeting spot such as a library, and it'll be up to each resident to come in and meet with the FEMA rep. FEMA rep. The city will be out of it, the county's out of it, It'll be between FEMA and the resident. But right now they can fill out our form and their insurance. If they get money for an insurance, that should be their number one priority. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Madam Chair. Thank you. Jones. Jones, um, go ahead, Mayor, please. There's also, uh, they mentioned, I mean, yeah, you do have to go to the insurance, but you don't make the mistake and uh, tell them something say hey, it, it came from the sewers because some residents it's coming from the walls and uh, that's different so when you tell the insurance it's it's coming from uh, the flood from the from the sewer automatically they're going to deny it they're going to say hey this is not a problem so you got to make sure when you do uh, call the insurance company to say that i mean obviously you got to tell them that w w what happened but if it's coming from the wall make sure you specify it came from the walls or from the door or something because some of the homes that uh, uh, Mr. Gavin and I we've been going through the whole week you know visiting homes uh, a lot of the water didn't actually come from the sewers it came from the uh, from the basement windows like there's one home that uh, the window shattered and it's coming from the basement window that's how the basement flooded or from the entry doors 
So you got to make sure that you're... Insurance. Yeah, for insurance purpose. Flooding insurance, and then there's a... A storm. Yeah, backup. it could be a storm. There's or it completely could be different insurances. So yeah, make sure, because most people are covered, but the insurance, are, right away, they deny it, because it's, they think it's coming from the sewer. Okay, Corporate mm -hmm. Counsel Miyake? Uh, yes, just very briefly. If you have insurance that may cover this, you should file a claim with your insurance company. And if you've ended up having a problem, uh, you should fill out the city survey form so that you're potentially covered with respect to FEMA. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair. Councilman Abdelhaq, go ahead, please. I have a question for our mayor. Can you tell the residents what have we done so far as a city and as county, basically, to relieve Thanks, this problem? And if there is anything in the work through the Congress to get funding to resolve this problem once and for all, for all our communities. Okay, so the day after the storm, we had meetings. They had an emergency meeting with the county, uh, state, and they also had uh, state police, uh, congressional delegates, uh, a lot of uh, Senate, uh, senators were online. So they're doing everything they can uh, to help the residents. So two things, one is with the survey, uh, what they want to do is they're trying to gather so the, uh, all the different cities, they turn in their assessment to the county. So in turn, the county takes these assessments with all the homes. We turned ours this morning. Even after we turned it in, we're still getting, we got an, uh, about another 100 or so. We're getting like 100 to 200 emails a day with just assessments. So the county takes those and they give them to the state. The state compiles them. It's not just a Wayne County issue. So there's other counties that were involved as well, or they were affected. So the state puts that together, and the state has to advocate. You know, they go through the federal, as Mr. Gavin mentioned. So they're trying to declare this as a national uh, disaster so they can get FEMA money. So right now, even though it was declared a state of emergency to the state, we still need the federals to declare it as a federal uh, disaster so we can get the money from FEMA. So. And another, the second thing is uh, there is something that was put on by that, uh, by both Congresswoman uh, uh, Dingle and Congresswoman uh, Rashida Tlaib uh, trying to get funding uh, to do more uh, research, investigation, on especially the Ecorse Creek. So I did see something that was put in place and they did ask for funding. Uh, it's about close to $2 million to do the investigation and to bring the Army Corps of Engineers again uh, to the area to investigate it, to see what they can do, to show that, hey, this is really bad, you know, we, we really need uh, more funding, trying to figure out what they can do uh, with the Ecorse Creek or some of the, the, flood, the, the flooding that we're having in Dearborn Heights. So they, they, they are working on it, you know, I've seen a lot of email traffic, you know, through our congressional delegates, and, you know, even Senator Peters, I've seen something just like a week ago, so it's getting a lot of attention, national attention right now with from state uh, U.S. senators, both uh, Stabenow and also Peters. So it is getting momentum right now trying to get funding, so they are listening. And uh, so we, we have good advocates trying to push for funding for trying to figure out what we can do uh, to, to resolve this flooding issue. And our city engineer is actually also is on the ground uh, looking at some issues. He's been inspecting uh, a lot of the sewers uh, throughout the city. So he is working with uh, you know, some of our you know, uh, congressional as well, trying to give them feedback, and is also trying to figure out a solution as well. Now for our disabled and older people who are living by themselves, do we have any list in the city who are those people and if they do need any urgent uh, replacement of furnace or water heater, do we have money in the CDBG uh, to do something like that on urgent basis? We, we actually had uh, several senior citizens that reached out and we have some entities that were able, able to help. There's somebody that was here earlier that has helped several senior citizens with their furnace and also their water heater. And I did talk to our CDBG. Uh, you know, they're, we're trying to figure out uh, what we, uh, how much money we can allocate from CDBG uh, for the senior citizens. And we did also ask with the chief of staff 
Uh, we uh, did call some senior citizens. We put it out there if any senior citizen that needs help, you know, to reach out. So we do have a list. So today's meeting, we had, uh, again, you know, huge participations from uh, the county, uh, from the state, from the congressional. A lot of s uh, state senators were present. Uh, they have, uh, they're trying to set up a hotline. We can't really discuss it right now because it hasn't, they're trying to man the hotline. Once they get the hotline up and running, hopefully within the next day or two, then residents can call that hotline and they can get volunteers and we can see if we can set up an emergency fund, you know, to help out, you know, those in need. So hopefully I'm giving updates daily and uh, I'll make sure, you know, the last meeting we had this morning, um, th they have a few things they're working on. They haven't really, uh, they're not concrete yet. Hopefully tomorrow I'll have more updates with that, especially with uh, uh, the number that they can call in, the hotline number. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, any other public comment before Madam we Chair. end? The Councilman Beatty. Thank you. And I, I just want to put this for the record, too. I know I had this conversation with uh, Councilman uh, Dave Abdullah. Um, you know, I, I've heard a lot of concerns from the residents and uh, one thing that, you know, this is this is an ongoing issue in the city of Dearborn Heights where, you know, homes are being flooded, people are having to strip it out, go back in, pull insurance, insurance is going up. You know, when you want to go sell that house, and I'm sure you can relate to this, Councilman Abdullah, now you know that this house is, you know, has had flooding in the past. Can we get a time stamp of when we can, you know, simply say that, hey, by August 21st, we're going to make sure that we have a certain plan in place that we're going to start executing on uh, and so that it's not being neglected or anything um, and, and if that's just something that could be done hey by you know and you can come back to council and say by august 21st or you know we've worked with dpw we've been working with our congressional districts we we're able to you know receive this much funding and i'm not saying august 21st as in i'm just throwing a hypothetical out there but uh, i don't want to just let this overpass us because we're not going to see any rain potentially until next year heavy rain to what we've seen recently um, and, it, and it might just be the whole 100 year storm. But who knows with global warming and everything that's happening, uh, you know, my family was devastated with this. My parents' house, my sister's house, my house. I know our Director Perry's basement. I'm sorry, to, and, and to the rest of the residents. And maybe only 1,100 were able to fill out the form, but I can tell you, I personally believe there's way well over 1,100 oh, yeah. uh, basements that were flooded. I agree. Um, so, so to me, it's this is an issue. I see Dearborn, where my in-laws had almost six inches of rain, uh, of, of sewage back up, the fridge and freezer are laying on the floor, they have no AC, they have no water heater. I don't want to see that happen to the residents of Dearborn Heights. So I, I would like to see a, some type of timestamp to be able to come back to us, uh, even if it's in November. But, but I don't want to just ignore this and wait for another storm to happen and say, well, you know, we lost track of time. We, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's what this actual comment's about. So if we can get some type of timestamp and a follow-up every couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further public comment? At this time, we will end our meeting. Everybody have a good night.